Hello? Okay, where are you located? 553 five, Sheldon. Okay, can you tell me what's going on there? Nine one one emergency. Well, I'm five fifty three seven. My sister's not moving. What's the address? Five fifty three seven. There's blood everywhere. My sister's not moving. He's one of the most wanted men in America. Accused of killing two women in the Grand Rapids home that he shared with them. There's a legend that some people are able to sense when they're about to pass on, almost like they can anticipate when they're close to their end. It is said to be a special gift as most people are often caught off guard. For Kiona Griffin, the experience was different. She had witnessed her aunt's life taken away right before her, and she knew she was next. Tragically, she had only a fleeting moment to make a 911 call to ask for help before her life was abruptly taken away. Why was Kiona's life tragically ended in such a horrific way? And why hasn't the man responsible been caught? Let's discover the mystery behind what happened to Kiona Griffin in the story of the girl who was murdered by her aunt's psycho boyfriend while on the phone with 911. The usual part about it is how he's been able to just completely disappear. On March 13, 2019, just before 10.30 a.m., 911 operators in Grand Rapids, Michigan, received a chilling call for help from a caller who only identified herself as Kiona. 911 emergency. Hi, Hello? Hi, Okay, where are you located? I'm sorry, ma'am, I can't hear you. Are you able to tell me where you're located? No. Are you at a... From the phone call, it was clear Kiona was terrified, and speaking in a whisper makes it very clear that she's not alone, and possibly in the same room as the person she's terrified of. Though she's really scared, Kiona stays on the phone to make sure the dispatcher got her address very clearly. Okay, I got Sheldon. What's the number? 553, hurry, please, hurry. 553, five, Sheldon. Okay, can you tell me what's going on there? Okay, ma'am, I'll start the police that way. Can you tell me what your name is? Kiana. Okay, I've got a call entered, so we're going to get the police started that way, all right? Though Kiona said please hurry up several times during the call, it would take officers 7 minutes and 41 seconds to arrive at the house, and when they did, they seemed to be missing the sense of urgency that should be expected given how scared Kiona sounded on the phone. The details related to the officers who showed up at the address Kiona gave was limiting and missed a lot of the details Kiona gave on the phone. In fact, they somehow missed the most important information of that phone call, that there had already been a murder, and Kiona feared she would be next. They were told there was a woman inside who felt she would be attacked by someone inside the house. As they approached the house, one of the officers said the call might be a 96, and then said that might make the situation interesting. For those who aren't familiar with police terms, a 10 to 96 is usually used to reference the caller having any kind of mental illness. This call looked interesting. Huh? I'm trying to kill her. It sounds like she could be 96 too. Categorizing the situation right off the bat, before they know what they're dealing with, is kind of bizarre. But the three officers who showed up at the address proceeded to knock on the door, but no one answered. They proceeded to knock several times, and still, no one came to the door. They listened for sounds in the house, but it was dead silent. They then decide to get a look into the house from the window, to see if they would be able to see anything. Anything that could be a reason for them to gain entry into the house with permission from a person who lived there or a warrant, neither of which were possible at the time. One officer in particular then checked out the side door of the home and waited a few seconds to see if anyone would come to the door, 
No one came. He knocked on the side door a number of times and got the same dead quiet, almost as if no one was home. When they didn't get any response from the doors, which were locked at the time, the officers took a look around the house to see if they would find anything. You see, they're not allowed to make their way into their house without either being invited, having a warrant to enter, or having probable cause. Finding something suspicious or alarming around the house might give them probable cause, but nothing in the compound jumps at them. This just goes around. There's nothing in the back here. If the officers had been told there already had been a murder inside of the house, like Kayona said on the phone, they would have had probable cause to force their way into the house. Instead, after a few minutes of knocking, one of the officers communicates with the dispatch who spoke to Kiona earlier, asking if Kiona's number can be dialed. 1870, we'll try to call back. But when the dispatch tried to call Kiona back, there was no answer. At this point, the officers had been at the residence for about three minutes, 42 seconds, knocking with no response. With nothing else they could do, the officers got in their vehicles and took off. But two hours after the officers left Kiona's residence, they were called back to the same address. Sheldon Avenue Southeast for female there not breathing, calling take a lot of blood. One emergency to an address is pretty usual, but two emergency calls to the same address within two hours of each other is everything but normal. The same three officers who were dispatched to 553 Sheldon Avenue around 10.30 a.m. that day were sent a second dispatch around 1 p.m. to the same address. Except this time, the call was made by Kiona's brother, Stanford Cummings. He had sounded pretty shaken on the phone as he told the dispatch that he had walked in to find his sister unresponsive. It looked like she had been fired at a number of times. 911 emergency. Well, no, my sister not moving. What's the address? 553 Sheldon, there's blood everywhere. My sister is not moving. Okay, stand on my, you said shirt? The dispatch tried to confirm if Kayona was breathing. I used to stop over here before I go to work so my granny house and her friends was over here outside and came in and I, I didn't even come upstairs. Ma'am, is she breathing? I'm not a ma'am. No, I'm a her brother. But her brother was too terrified. He insisted he didn't know because he wasn't a doctor and the dispatch should hurry and send medics. I don't know. I'm not a doctor. Please come out. Yeah, somebody stabbed her or something. She's been stabbed. It's pretty normal for people to shut down after witnessing a traumatic scene, and it looks like that's what happened with Kiona's brother. This time around, it would take seven minutes from the moment Kiona's brother called 911 to the time they actually showed up. By the time the same three officers arrived on the scene, they found Kiona in the upstairs bedroom. But it was too late. She was already gone. The officers observed that she had been fired at four times, including once in her face. But that wasn't all. While searching through the house, the officers made another chilling discovery. An older woman, laying face down on the bed in one of the bedrooms had also been fired at. She was also declared dead at the scene. Kiona's brother was able to identify the older woman as his aunt, 47-year-old Sherletta Baber Bay. Almost immediately, a forensic team arrived on the scene to photograph it while the officers took a look around the inside of the house this time. They noticed that Sherletta had been laying on the bed under a blanket, propped up on a pillow watching a movie when she was attacked. From the placement of her body, it looked like she was completely caught off guard and she never even got the chance to raise her head to see her attacker. She likely did not know she was in danger until it was too late. The iPad. She was watching the movie on was still playing when Sherletta was found, and her earbuds were still in her ear. The officers also made a number of discoveries that painted a picture of what happened. 
Inside the same bedroom, the officers found shell cases on the floor, as well as duct tape that appeared to be smeared with red bodily fluid. The forensics took photos of everything in both bedrooms, documenting everything exactly as they were to analyze later. The officers then search areas around the house, and they find something. In an alleyway, not so far from the house, they saw a box of ammunition that had been carelessly thrown away, amongst other things. It looked like whoever had committed the crime had hastily disposed of his weapons before fleeing. The discovery of the items in the alley, as well as the photos of the crime scene, was enough to kickstart an investigation. But little did the officers know that this case would take on different twists and turns that would last years. The phantom who left a very visible trail. In an alley behind the home on Sheldon, police said they found a hastily tossed box of ammunition with eight rounds missing, and in a plastic bag, a nine millimeter pistol later matched to rounds at the crime scene. The first step after the investigation began was to test the weapon found in the alley with the shell casings found at the scene, and it turned out to be a match. Now all they had to do was find the serial number of the weapon, and they would be able to trace it to the owner. The serial number had, however, been scraped off the weapon, so the detectives went back to the house on 553 Sheldon Avenue, southeast, to search again. They concentrated the search on Sherletta's room, as it looked like she had been the intended victim. Keona, it seemed, had been caught in the crossfire. Upon searching Sherletta's bedroom, detectives found a weapon box that appeared to be empty. It had been stuffed in a dresser full of men's clothing. Tucked inside the box, detectives hit the jackpot. They found the serial number they were looking for as well as the purchase permit, which thankfully included the name of the woman who purchased it. They ran the serial number through their database, and it turned out the woman who bought it had reported it stolen in 2017. Further investigation into the woman brought with it a lot of information. They found out that she had filed complaints against her ex-boyfriend, who she went out with in summer 2017. The complaint was for harassment. The woman noted that after their relationship ended and the man moved out, her weapon disappeared. She noted that she knew the ex-boyfriend as Jay. Armed with this information, detectives went to speak to Cherletta's family. Their aim was to figure out a connection between Jay and whoever Cherletta had been living with that owned the dresser they found the weapon in. There was indeed a lot of connection between the two men. It turned out the man Cherletta had been seeing was also known as Jay. Cherletta's family noted that they did not know his real name, only that he went by Jay. In fact, as they were asked a lot of questions about him, it turned out there was a lot they didn't know about him. People knew him, but, you know, knew he was there, but didn't really know much about him or anything like that. He was kind of a phantom. But he was a phantom who made Charletta happy, so her family didn't press him for information. The family told detectives that Charletta and Jay had met in a library and had quickly hit it off. Their relationship surprised her family because she was not known to date. In fact, to her family's knowledge, she had never dated anyone until she met Jay. Charletta had been very shy growing up and never had any boyfriends in high school. This continued into her adulthood, although her family said she desperately wanted to be in a relationship, fall in love, get married, and start a family. That was always her dream. But somehow, she never seemed to catch anybody's interest. So when she met Jay, the family were both relieved and happy for her. She really loved Jay. My sister, she loved him. She didn't have, she had never had a boyfriend before. And at first, Jay seemed nice. She didn't have any boyfriends really during high school. So this was her first, you know, kind of someone who paid attention to her. And at first he seemed nice. But as their relationship progressed, her family started to notice a few odd things about him. He was described as being very quiet. He never had a lot to say. And when he did, he usually talked about various conspiracy theories he believed were true. He didn't seem to have friends at all, and didn't have a job as far as they knew. He never went anywhere, and was always at home with Cherletta. He moved in with her not long after they got together. 
Despite the many concerning things about him, Charletta's family welcomed him into the family. All they cared about was that he seemed to make Charletta happy. Some people say he was a little strange, he was a little different, you know, but they said that about my sister too. She was quiet, you know, she wasn't a social person. So just because you're quiet and you're a little different than everyone else doesn't mean that you're a murderer. If only they had any idea what was coming for them. They never saw him coming. This man blindsided all of us. According to Jacqueline Baber Bay, Charletta's mother and 25-year-old Kiona's grandmother, March 13, 2019, started out like every other day. Jacqueline owned the house on Sheldon Avenue, but Charletta, her boyfriend Jay, and Kiona all lived in that house together. The house is located in a prime area in Grand Rapids and is considered one of the best places to live in Grand Rapids due to its proximity to the city center. But as great as it is to live in Grand Rapids, Michigan, there's a different side to it. A side not many people are familiar with. Grand Rapids has a high rate of crimes at a rate of 18.07 per 1,000 residents. And homicides account for a large number of that. Up until March 13th, though, Charletta's family has managed to stay out of trouble. But on that day, everything changed. According to Jacqueline Baber Bay, she left for work around 8 a.m. that morning, leaving behind Charletta, Jay, and Kayona. When she left, everything seemed to be fine. I leave the house at 8 o'clock in the morning. Everything was fine. By the time she returned, everything had changed. She had lost a daughter and a granddaughter, all within a matter of hours. With what detectives got from Charletta's family, it was looking more and more that Jay was their likely suspect, but they still didn't have enough to find him. There were no leads or clues that could lead them to him. Detectives then questioned Sherletta's family about where Sherletta could have met Jay, and no one seemed to know. Family members told detectives Jay and Sherletta had kept to themselves a lot, preferring to spend most of their time holed up in their room. And since they both were quiet people, this didn't concern Sherletta's family very much. Detectives then tried social media, but without his real name, they didn't get very far. Sherletta's family also didn't have Jay's phone number, so they couldn't even run that through the system. At this point, it seemed the investigation had hit a dead end. Detectives then decided to search through the house on Sheldon Avenue one more time. This time, they went through it, slowly, combing through every inch of the house with precision, and it paid off. They found a shoebox, hidden away deep into Cherletta's closet, in a place where it would not easily be seen, almost like she was hiding it on purpose, and when detectives opened it up, they realized why. In the shoebox was a collection of letters between Charletta and Jay, from jail. It seemed they did not meet in a library as Charletta had told her family, but rather they were pen pals when Jay was in jail, other than him being in prison at some time. Detectives found out a lot more. Starting with his real name, Daryl Demon Brown. He had disclosed that to Charletta in one of her letters, and she had kept it a secret from everyone she knew and loved. With a name, the investigation got a whole lot easier. Since he had been to prison, he was already in the system, and it didn't take long for detectives to find some information about him, like how he was arrested back in 2013 and a photo of him they took to Charletta's family for confirmation. They confirmed that Jay and Daryl were one and the same, but that wasn't all the detectives found out. They were also able to trace people who knew him before he came to live with the Babel Bays. Reverend Robert Dean believes it was a couple years before the murders that he spotted Brown rummaging through his church's dumpster, found out he was homeless, and let him live for several months in Dean's New Life Church of God in Christ, until one of Brown's girlfriends, not Sherlita, paid the pastor a visit. Reverend Dean had a lot to say about Daryl and provided some pieces to the puzzle that was Jay. She felt he was very nice, very mannerable, but there was that certain little element she was afraid of. According to the Reverend, as Daryl's girlfriend was about to reveal the element of him, she couldn't quite understand. Daryl himself barged into the Reverend's office. I said, well, I was just talking about you. <laughs> And he come, well, I forbid her to talk to males. Oh, no, you're not. I said, now, you sit down, 
I said, it's my office. The Reverend said as the woman was about to speak out, Daryl tried to attack her, and the Reverend had to step in to stop him from hurting her. He then told Daryl he was no longer allowed in the church, and he could never return to the church. From their investigation into Daryl's past, detectives were able to pinpoint a pattern of behavior. They managed to track down another ex of his who also happened to be the mother of one of his children. She was full of horrific stories about him. Daryl managed to plead guilty only to a misdemeanor. Police had given the a three-hour head start, said the victim's family. Sherlita's boyfriend, Darrell Damon Brown, had lived in the home on Sheldon for at least two years by then, but the family knew him only as Jay. A few days after Sherletta and Keona were unalived in their home, Daryl Brown, who was now the number one suspect, was still nowhere to be found. Sherletta's family members held the officers who were dispatched to 553 Sheldon Avenue responsible. According to them, by choosing not to force their way into that house on that tragic day, they gave Daryl time to escape. He was probably still in that house the first time they showed up, and if they had listened to Kiona when she called, they could have possibly saved her life or at least arrested the man that took it. But then yeah. you have someone calling you yeah. saying someone is trying to kill mm -hmm. me and you won't knock down the door. You don't know. She could have been but tied up in this house. Anything. She could anything. But according to the authorities, the officers did all they could on that day. It was you know, quiet and the doors were locked. They defended the actions of the officers, saying they had no probable cause to break into a private property. Kayona's phone call simply wasn't enough of a reason, the authorities said. No blood, you know, it's a, it's a shut up house. You know, there's there, you know, the house is a very protected Fourth Amendment. They're very, you, you gotta have some pretty good reasons to go in. And, you know, there, there gotta be something that drive them more than just a phone call. Sherletta's family insisted the officers didn't care enough and only did the bare minimum. A bare minimum that led them back to the same address a few hours too late. They didn't care. They was here a minimum of three minutes and they went on about their happy way. And then at one o'clock or so, you get they another call and the to the same house. And the same and you officers come here come and now back. you got to bring my family out in body bags because you didn't care at 10 o'clock. This created a lot of outrage in the community with many people saying the officers as well as the first dispatch who received Keona's call failed her. This added to the pressure of finding Daryl Brown, and within a few days after the tragic event, detectives had a pretty good timeline of where he had gone after he left the house on Sheldon Avenue. The police checked for cameras around the area after the murders. They found several videos showing where Daryl went that day cameras caught him walking a mile away from where the crime happened, two hours after the second 911 call. As police searched for evidence, surveillance cameras caught sight of Brown on foot a mile north of the crime scene. They found out that he stopped at different places. His movements, though, were a little erratic and confusing. For one, he stopped at the Grand Rapids Children's Museum. Cameras inside the museum recorded him going in at 3.24 p.m., and leaving 12 minutes later at 3.36 p.m. Daryl told the front desk he knew someone inside, but the staff said he couldn't wander around the museum. Among his stops post the Grand Rapids Children's Museum, watch as he walks with purpose to the front desk, reportedly telling workers he knew someone inside before exiting 12 minutes later. About 20 minutes after leaving the Children's Museum, Another business's surveillance camera in downtown Grand Rapids recorded him walking in a different part of the city. Detectives found out that one of Daryl's ex-girlfriends had given him a ride to that neighborhood. However, after that, he seemed to disappear. Detectives couldn't trace where he went after that point. It's like he just vanished. Soon after, it seems Darrell Brown vanished. At first, Daryl was just someone the investigators were interested in regarding the murders. However, as time went on, the Kent County prosecutors charged him with receiving and concealing a stolen firearm. A judge then told investigators to bring him in from anywhere in the country if he's arrested and extradite him to Grand Rapids on the firearms charge. Unfortunately, they couldn't find him. A reward of $1,500 was offered for any information that could help locate him. 
Over the next few months, there were reports of Daryl being potentially seen in various states. Grand Rapids police are extending their search nationwide now for a man who may be connected to two murders. Detectives widened the scope of their search for Daryl way outside the state of Michigan. Search for a dangerous man has come to ATL right here in Atlanta. The FBI wants you to be on the lookout for 45 year old Darrell Brown. Yeah, that's right. Now, this is a double murder investigation from Michigan, but authorities believe he may be headed to our neck of the woods. News stations all over the country were alerted to how dangerous Daryl really was so they could warn residents. One of the most wanted men in America accused of killing two women in the Grand Rapids home that he shared with them. Daryl quickly climbed up the list of the 15 most wanted men in America. I want to return now to the story we brought you just a moment ago, a nationwide manhunt for 47-year-old Daryl Brown, one of the nation's most wanted criminals following the gruesome murders of two women in Grand Rapids, Michigan. But three years would pass, and there would be no sign of Daryl. It was like he completely banished off the surface of the earth. The usual part about it is how he's been able to just completely disappear. Some members of law enforcement believe Daryl never left Grand Rapids, and he's just been hiding in plain sight, right under everyone's noses. Darrell DeMond Brown is still out there, likely hiding in plain sight, nearly three years after the horrific double murder on Sheldon Avenue. But unfortunately, none of Daryl's family members were willing to help detectives find him leading them to theorize that one of them was probably hiding him. U.S. Marshals believe Brown fled the state and may be getting help from associates or family. To intensify the search for him and to encourage people to step forward, the authorities placed a reward of $25,000 for anyone with information that could lead to his capture. Darrell DeMond Brown, now 48, grew up in Grand Rapids, but U.S. Marshals say he also has relatives in Wisconsin, Arizona, Georgia, and Ohio. There's a $25,000 reward for information that leads directly to his arrest. But unfortunately, this story does not end here. Tonight, new information about the two victims in a fire in Grand Rapids this weekend. Crews tell us that a home on Sheldon and Buckley that's just off of Division Avenue caught fire yesterday morning near downtown Grand Rapids. Unfortunately, the Baber Bay family story would take another heartbreaking turn in July 2020, when yet another distressing 911 call led emergency services to respond to that same house. It's been three years since a killer gunned down two women inside their home here on Sheldon Southeast. That house is gone now, bulldozed after fire tore through it, a fire fueled by the heartbreak that came before. A member of the local church Jacqueline attended identified the victims of the fire as Jacqueline and her five-year-old grandson. It seemed tragedy was not getting done with the family. A local church identified one of the victims as a church elder, Jacqueline Baybeer. Baber Bay, she says the other victim was her five-year-old great-grandson, Amarion. According to the firefighters, not much survived the fire. Captain Paul Mason of the Grand Rapids Fire Department stated that the 911 call reporting the fire was received at 9.02 a.m. The first responding crew encountered a substantial amount of fire on the front of the house, and despite cars being in the driveway, no one was outside. This raised concerns among the responders. Firefighters first discovered 65-year-old Jacqueline Baber Bay and her five-year-old great grandson, E.J. Cummings, in a second-floor bedroom at the rear of the house. The official cause of the fire was ruled accidental. The family had conducted a vigil for Cherletta and Keona the night before, and the house fire was ignited by the candles left out that night. This casted a darker shadow on the town of Grand Rapids, increasing the pressure on the authorities to find him. In February 2020, a warrant for the arrest of Daryl Brown was issued. Hey, thanks for watching. Our heart goes out to the family and friends of Keona Griffin. What are your thoughts on this case? Do you know of other similar cases? Let me know in a comment and before you go, make sure you like, subscribe, and hit that bell button. See you next time and stay safe.